and try to imagine what will be uh, TAVI in, let's say, one year. And, uh, and I think that um, I imagine the TAVI in uh, one year, or, or patients with aortic stenosis in, uh, in the near future, to go through a, an aortic valve clinic, where I think all of them will have an echo. Coronary angiography, maybe 3D CT, not only for the annulus measurements, but I think that uh, some of these coronary angiographies can be avoided in many of these patients, especially when you think that the lower risk uh, group has a much uh, lower rate of, uh, of prevalence of coronary disease. And then there will be a straightforward uh, risk evaluation, including frailty measures. After all this uh, information, there will be a hard team discussion. And after hard team discussion, I think that the vast majority of patients will, will have a TAVI procedure. Um, we know the results from uh, partner and uh, SURTAVI trials in intermediate patients, not only for death, but also for uh, uh, neurological complications. The stroke is no more a higher uh, uh, higher incidence with uh, TAVR than with uh, surgery is, is in fact the contrary. And you all know the results from the partner three trials showing the superiority of uh, uh, the Sapien 3 versus, <clears throat> versus a standard surgery for death, stroke, or rehospitalization. You know the non inferiority results of the Evolute Low Risk trial. I think that we all expect that uh, FDA and the, all the, the health authorities uh, uh, will will uh, relatively rapidly approve TAVI for uh, low-risk patients. However, we are still dealing with, uh, with the, one of the most difficult groups of patients, which are those at extreme risk, where TAVI can be a futile treatment. We have worked a lot on that among these 200 publications. I think that a lot of them, at least at the beginning, were trying to identify which are the patients that don't benefit from these procedures. We're still struggling with that. I, I, I think that um, we can say that we you have three main types of comorbidities. You have mainly organ comorbidities, and this is mainly uh, lung disease and uh, chronic kidney disease as the two main players here. We did a lot of work on that a few years ago, and I think that there are some factors that seem to identify a very high risk group of patients. A simple test, like a six meter walk test, can be very useful in these patients. Dialysis patients, particularly when you combine dialysis and atrial fibrillation, seem to have a very poor prognosis. However, it's always a case by case decision. Frailty measures, you have plenty of, of, uh, of frailty uh, uh, studies in, uh, in TABI. I would uh, I suggest, uh, in fact, to use simple things that you will be able to do in, uh, uh, systematically in all patients. The CAT activities uh, index is not bad in addition to the uh, five meter speed. And then you have cardiovascular conditions that usually uh, are related to very low ejection fractions and multivalvular disease and uh, pulmonary hypertension. However, in these cases, we, we, we let um, uh, a prospective registry called TOPASTAVI in one of the highest risk group of patients in terms of cardiovascular condition, which is the low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. And the results were reasonably good, much better, in fact, the, the historical uh, surgical series, at least uh, with a reasonable 30 day mortality. Then the mortality at one, two, two years is much higher than the mortality we observe currently in TAVI. But probably the most important message is even if you don't have contractile reserve on stress echo uh, before the procedure, uh, this doesn't seem to be a factor to refuse the patient. Sometimes in our prior experience, we, oh, well, you have 25% ejection fraction, uh, mean gradient of, uh, of uh, 25, no contractile reserve, and this influenced our results, and in fact, uh, we, we didn't see an important effect uh, in, uh, even in the uh, improvement uh, of ejection fraction in these patients. There will be still a significant number of patients that will be better suited for uh, surgery. 
uh, in, uh, in among the low to intermediate risk patients. Those with uh, uh, severe coronary disease, I think that there have been a study showing no impact of uh, severe coronary disease, but remember that partner excluded patients with high syntax scores, as uh, it was the case also with Sortavia and Evolutar. These, these are not patients enrolled in, uh, in these trials, and the vast majority of studies have shown a correlation between an association between severity of coronary disease and uh, uh, poor, poorer TAR outcomes. I think that these patients are probably better suited for uh, surgery. You have also to remember that uh, you ha we have coronary events post we, we have not talked a lot about that. This is maybe probably the first study from uh, our center looking specifically at this uh, type of, uh, of events. And we have to talk about these, uh, these potential issue, issues of coronary access uh, after TAVI. This will be uh, more and more important with these patients living much longer than the patients that we treated uh, 10 years ago. And then uh, these also, I think, may influence uh, uh, the uh, selection of the valve in certain group of patients, especially those with uh, severe coronary disease treated with PCI. There is no doubt that patients with multivalvular disease uh, uh, do less, uh, less well than those without uh, valve, uh, other valvular disease like mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation. Up to now, uh, we can say that uh, in uh, transcatheter we have uh, uh, an alternative that is similar to surgery, at least for low-risk uh, patients, uh, similar for, uh, for uh, the tricuspid regurgitation, meaning that Patients with multivalvular disease, I'm talking about low to intermediate uh, risk, are uh, going to have probably surgery in, uh, in the next years. About bicuspid disease, I think that the results are very promising, especially with the uh, newer generation valves. There are some talks about uh, uh, the need for a randomized trial in this specific group of patients that uh, for sure in younger patients will become more important. I'm not sure about that. I think that uh, maybe with uh, good registry uh, data, uh, uh, we can show probably that uh, these newer generation valves uh, work quite well in these uh, patients as it, they work in uh, tricuspid uh, patients. Uh, Robert talked about the risk of coronary obstruction. For sure, this is an important aspect that uh, can uh, also influence our decision about uh, TAVI or uh, surgery. We uh, ran this study a few years ago with uh, uh, multiple centers trying to identify the factors. It's all, all, uh, are, um, uh, it's all on, on the coronary height and the uh, dimensions of the scene of Valsalva, life-threatening complication, meaning that if you anticipate a higher risk, I think that uh, you have to send the patient uh, for surgery. And uh, we have seen the uh, Basilica that is a very nice alternative in high-risk patients. We have been treating also patients with large annuli. We know that TAVI is very good, is better, in fact, than surgery in terms of hemodynamics for small annuli. But we need, in fact, in the future, larger valves to address this uh, problem of patients with large annually. We have been using off-level, uh, uh, especially balloon expandable valves overfilled with three to five uh, more cc's of uh, volume with reasonable results. But for sure, if you have a low risk patient with a large valve, I think that with the technology we have nowadays, this patient uh, will do better with uh, surgery. And then we have this problem that uh, we have been interested uh, for many years. At the beginning, some people were saying to us, well, this is nothing, the pacemaker thing, and now will become the major issue in the low risk population. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the rate of pacemaker you see here, the newer generation valves, it has not disappeared in some instances. It has even uh, increased. And, uh, and I think that uh, when you are in front of a patient and you have to decide uh, uh, TAVI or surgery, I think that uh, the presence of a right bounder blanch block pre-procedure may influence your decision because uh, there is for sure a very consistent risk marker of uh, increased uh, pacemaker rates, and maybe these patients uh, can be uh, sent to, uh, uh, to surgery to avoid that, especially because we know that, well, pacemaker is a permanent sequelae per se, 
you have a lead, you have a pacemaker with all the infections, the potential issues at long term, but also uh, uh, having a, a, a pace that rim may influence and will influence, in fact, your uh, uh, ventricular function and increase uh, the uh, heart failure rehospitalizations. What about then the procedure per se, the uh, TAVI procedure? I think that uh, is not 2020. Is uh, nowadays already uh, we do all most of the procedures under uh, local anesthesia. Robert talked about the non-transfemoral approach. I think that all the results that you have seen in these intermediate risk trials, low risk, all are transfemoral. Meaning that when you are facing a patient that where you don't have a transfemoral access, you have to think that really the results that, uh, that uh, apply to uh, these, low, these um, uh, good trials in low to intermediate risk patients do not apply to these patients. Um, I think that uh, we know now that thoracotomy is not good. Uh, you have to use really a, a vascular solution uh, transubclavian, transcarotid is, is, uh, could be a good alternative, and as Robert uh, said, also uh, the transcaval uh, can be also a possibility. In our center, we developed in the last years a, a lot of experience with the transcarotid approach. We are very pleased with, and uh, we have now uh, close to 150 patients treated through uh, the transcarotid approach. Very easy, straightforward. And uh, we didn't see really in this uh, propensity score that uh, we saw, in fact, uh, a superiority of this transcarotid approach is not uh, as expected, I would say, with respect to the approaches requiring thoracotomy. We are now also comparing these with the uh, transfemoral approach, and the results are quite similar also in terms of, uh, of stroke. France is the is the leading country with uh, this technology. And in fact, before starting, we called the French people who started this to say, as, as Robert said, are you completely crazy or this uh, works for? Uh, and, um, and they explained to us that they had a very good experience. And I know that there is uh, data in, in many, many hundreds of patients that will be reported comparing this approach and probably the subclavian also to transfemoral. And it's, it seems to be quite competitive. As I always say, the question is, because you see centers doing like 98% transfemoral. In order to do 98% transfemoral, you have to treat vascular disease. There is no way that you have, or you have an extremely good patient selection. But in general, the patients that we are treating, either you have to put a stand, balloon, etc. Is this better? than using an alternative approach. This is the question, because uh, there are centers that are extremely aggressive treating the uh, peripheral disease. Maybe this is the best, best solution to achieve the transfemoral approach or uh, to use an alternative. As I said, uh, I think that uh, we all centers now are using mainly um, um, uh, local uh, uh, anesthesia. I think that it has been uh, shown that this is, uh, is, uh, is safe. Uh, more and more we are discharging the patients uh, very early. I think that in a, in a meeting that uh, we were there with Eric, I think that sometimes these deconditioned patients that we are treating sometimes that have been in the hospital for many days are much more difficult to discharge the next day. But here is a very nice example, the 3M, 3M um, uh, trial led by the Vancouver group showing really very good results in patients discharged at day one after, after. I think in the low risk population, this will be a reality. However, I think, I don't know uh, the details, but in our experience, all these conduction issues that are around there in many, many patients, uh, you, uh, honestly, uh, are, um, it's, it's a problem in order to uh, an early discharge of the patient. I don't think that we have a very good solution except if you are extremely aggressive and you have a new onset layer of BBB, and then you implant a pacemaker, and then you uh, discharge the patient. I think it's uh, is one of the issues that uh, I think will be there in the next years. And then you have plenty of choices now, and uh, good choices for uh, uh, valve, uh, valve selection. In our, in our center, I think, and, and many centers, I imagine, we do like a Tylert approach. We use mainly uh, Sapien 3 and, and uh, a, a Bullet Pro. And for sure, when we have very high Gagaston scores, large annually, horizontal orders, I think that uh, 
the, the, the sapiens three uh, uh, for at least in our experience uh, uh, is better. However, when you have a risk of annulus rupture, when you have doubts about uh, the uh, coronary head, the postulative coronary obstruction, the Evolute Pro is the is the one we are choosing. I think that uh, when you start a, a program, you need uh, uh, probably a balloon expandable, but you need also to have always a self-expandable valve. We are missing really valves like this one, the Meridian valve, which is a valve that can be fully retrieved and planted. This is the final position of the valve. You evaluate the coronaries, you evaluate the result, you evaluate everything, you are happy, you uh, release the valve, it doesn't move, it doesn't change really uh, the shape. Lotus H uh, is back. I think that it was the only valve fully retrievable. When we are talking about low risk patients, I think that this type of valves can be uh, very interesting in, in many cases. I'm not going to bother you about the properties of each valve. I would say that now a valve uh, of newer generation has to have maximum 5% moderate to severe leaks. This is the cutoff that all the valves uh, have, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, as, a, as a result, and no more than 30, 35% mild paravalvular leaks. This is the case for the uh, Sapiens 3. As you know, the new generation, it will be even easier to implant. You don't need to alienate the balloon with the stand in the descending aorta, otherwise it's the same valve. Uh, you see also the results with the Evolute Pro with no cases in a small series of uh, moderate severe leak. The Centera valve with very nice results in terms of conduction disturbances. This is also something that we take into account in our experience when we select a patient, has he an RBBB? If so, then we try to uh, sometimes uh, select a, a different valve type, uh, the Portico one. Uh, the accurate nail. I think that all of them have presented very nice results in terms of paravalvular leaks. Not as uh, surgery, uh, surgery yet, but uh, very close. And then uh, when we are talking about uh, closing the vascular access, we're still using and not dedicated devices that work quite well in the majority of cases, but I think that there's room for improvement. The Manta device is one of them. I didn't have the experience, uh, we, I don't have experience with the device, but the results that were presented uh, uh, were, uh, were quite uh, promising. I think that there is room for improvement and in the next years we will see more devices. But something that people has um, paid a lot of attention and we were interested uh, many years ago was about the secondary access. Because sometimes when you receive a call from the floor after the TABI procedure say, whoa, whoa, whoa hematoma, then you go, you run because you think, wow, something wrong. And then is the, the second, the primary access is perfect because you were so careful, the pair closed, the, the injection. But the secondary access, anyone, okay, I don't know, put an angel shield, do what you want, you know? And, and, and the number of complications related to secondary access uh, 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 is quite, uh, quite high, I would say, for sure, not as the primary. But still, you have like one fourth of complications that uh, are related to the secondary access. This is why we started many years ago using the transradial as, as the default uh, access, secondary access in most patients. Now we have uh, an, a study with close to 1,000 patients with transradial approach. And when you compare these in a propensity match uh, analysis with uh, uh, transfemoral patients as secondary approach, we see major differences in bleeding and even in mortality. It's difficult to, to prove in a retrospective manner, but is, I think that we all know that transradial is better than transfemoral. Why not should be better here? It's uh, all patients, even if you have a perfect puncture, et cetera, you will have these kinds of complications. The problem is if you want to then to use uh, the crossover technique, Sometimes you have problems uh, to access to, to the, you don't have balloons that have the enough length to go from the radial up to the femoral. And uh, this is the reason why I, I had the, the opportunity to develop very long balloons with uh, a company from uh, Barcelona in, in Spain. And it's the only balloon that uh, reaches two meters. Uh, even if it's a very tall patient, a huge tortuosity, etc you can reach from a radial to uh, uh, femoral with no problem. And, and I think that this is uh, important 
if you uh, uh, use the uh, transradial approach. We don't have yet, however, the stents that uh, go from radial up to femoral, meaning that you have to control hemostasis with your balloon if you have a problem and then puncture the uh, contralateral uh, artery. In terms of a stroke, you have seen uh, that we uh, have now better results than surgery, but there is still room for improvement. There is not a lot of improvement in this particular uh, complication, and this is why uh, the embolic protection devices uh, are there trying to, to reduce these complications. As you know, none of them has shown yet definite results. In terms, I'm talking about MRI, not even clinical events. Uh, despite of that, and for the first time, I think, in history, and maybe Robert is more aware of, of that, the FDA approved a device with a negative trial because of that, the histopathologic debris. In all cases treated with the filters, uh, you had debris in the filters, and this was so impressive that even the FDA with no uh, really, uh, uh, with a negative trial, as I said, approved the device. And now in many centers in US, these devices are used systematically. But these devices are, are costly. This is a meta-analysis suggesting that there is an advantage. Honestly, I don't see how you are, will be able to demonstrate a cost efficacy with the stroke rates we have that can be improved, especially considering that not all strokes occur immediately after. There are many factors involved in these strokes. For sure, the emboli is there. It's an important one, at least for half of the patients. But then you have new onset of FIB that is very important. And then you have the, uh, the, the, the atero ateroma burden of the patients, et cetera. It's, it's a very complex issue. And uh, again, I'm not sure that, um, that, uh, that we are going to protect uh, all patients in, uh, in the near future, at least based on clinical data. And then regarding the conduction disturbances, I think that one of the major issues with this, I've never seen in my career something with more variability than the management of these patients. Not only between centers, also in the center, between different EEPs, you talk to one, they say one thing, the other, the other day another thing, nobody knows what to do. This is the reality. And then you see, even in, in, in some trials, um, with well-collected data, centers with 30% pacemaker rate, 30%, and others 4%. Same valve, good operators, something is, is going on, something is wrong. And we are trying really, and this was a first attempt, trying to provide some kind of guidance based on the data we have. Unfortunately, no randomized data, a lot of retrospective data, et cetera, but at least to provide. And now we are finishing really a consensus with uh, a bunch of EEPs and interventional cardiologists that have been interested in, the field, in this field that will, uh, that will came up in, in, in a few months, trying really to provide some kind, trying to, to provide some kind of guidance, um, especially to have a more uniform uh, way of practice in, uh, in this problem. LBBB is, is one of the most difficult issues because uh, for sure it can progress, but also it can regress. Uh, and sometimes uh, uh, stays uh, as, uh, as, uh, as in the uh, immediate postoperative uh, period. We know now we, we did the first study with an implantable cardiac monitor in this particular group of patients, the MARE trial, and we found a significant burden of arrhythmias. Not only Brady, also tachyarrhythmias in this group of patients, and a significant proportion, more than 10%, had a significant progression of the LVV towards uh, uh, severe bradyarrhythmia requiring a, a pacemaker. The good news are that half of these events occurred in the first months after that, in the very first weeks. Meaning that, because the, for sure, the reveal link and other implantable devices are expensive and probably are, are, uh, is not cost effective then I think that we have devices that can monitor patients for two to four weeks. This would, uh, uh, this would probably be a very reasonable solution for these patients. EEP studies have been done in US, it's very popular for different reasons. The problem is, the, is that, again, this is, uh, you have the LVV one day, and it's very difficult to, uh, this is a changing uh, issue. Uh, sometimes some patients, as like I said, regress, some uh, progress. 
And I will, I will end this, uh, this uh, section talking about the antithrombotic treatment, another kind of um, topic that has evolved completely empirically with this recommendation that is still there in 2017 with no single data showing anything about the aspirin plavix combination in these patients. We performed the trial that up to date is the largest one, is a small trial still, but showing really a clear tendency of a, uh, uh, towards a harm with the dual antiplatelet therapy compared to aspirin alone. Uh, related to, uh, to a higher uh, risk of major life-threatening uh, bleeding events. And uh, when we did a patient-level meta-analysis in addition to uh, another uh, two uh, small trials uh, from Europe, we found uh, very similar things. It's not definite that. I agree with that. The popular TAVI that hopefully will be presented either by the end of this year or next year will provide a final answer with a much larger cohort of patients. But I think that at least in the European guidelines, single acetylplatelet therapy is a possibility uh, in uh, patients with high bleeding risk, which in fact are the vast majority of patients that are, are, uh, are undergoing TAVI nowadays. In the Canadian consensus, for the first time, there will, this will be the recommendation. One single antiplatelet agent, no uh, two antiplatelet. Because I think that now the data we have is more, uh, is, uh, is uh, points towards the, the safety of this alternative versus dual antiplatelet therapy. Again, when a patient needs anticoagulation, then try to avoid combinations. I think that we know this from the coronary uh, field, and it's not different here. When you uh, start combining drugs, then the bleeding rates increase, usually with not much effect in ischemic events. This is a, a, another study that we had the opportunity to, to do with other centers, and I think it's, it's, it's not really very uh, like new. It's, it's, I would say that the results are expected. My, my point here is, try to be minimalist. I think that these are uh, relative, uh, elderly patients, high risk bleeding is, is always there. And I think that trying to avoid many combinations, except if you have like, severe coronary disease, stands, et cetera, I think that is the best way to move forward. However, we have other problems regarding these antiplatelet or anticoagulation issue, which is subclinical valve thrombosis in a proportion of patients. Here is 7%, it goes up to 15% when you do 4 DCT. And this, as you know, created a, a big debate in the field about, uh, about the, this problem, it was in, or even a, a, a valve type, a, 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 a valve study that was stopped because of that. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I always, uh, I think that you can't really detect these cases. These cases exist but can be detected, at least some of them, with serial echoes. You see a mild increase in gradients. I would say that when you have an increase in mean gradient over 10 millimeters of mercury, it's, it's suspicious that something is going on. And in our daily practice, in some of these patients, we are giving anticoagulation. Uh, I don't think that some, in some debates you see people saying, well, maybe we have to do four DCTs everyone, to everyone. I, I don't think so, it's because especially when we look at the, at the numbers, are relatively low. This is not, not, not uh, something that occurs in 60% uh, of the patients, and especially at least in our, in our data, it doesn't seem that this, patient, this has a major impact. It doesn't have a major impact in the uh, progression of the uh, gradients. Many times they remain stable after this initial increase and uh, neither in, uh, in, um, in clinical events, particularly stroke. I know that there are studies suggesting that maybe more TIAs, but there is no really strong data. I, think that, uh, that I, think, I don't think that this should uh, translate into systematic anticoagulation to all patients. Maybe short term, it's a possibility that in the future, I think can be very appealing, one to three months uh, 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 anticoagulation followed by antiplatelet treatment. And as you know, there are trials now trying to demonstrate that systematic anticoagulation to all patients is the best way to, to go, is the best antithrombotic treatment. The Lantis trial that will be presented probably in 2020, but as you know, also the Galileo trial was stopped 
because of, uh, of a harm effect uh, in associ associated with uh, Charelto. I'm not really surprised when you really anticoagulate all these patients systematically, you, you, you can have uh, more events. And then I, I will end only uh, talking very briefly about the follow-up. And follow-up is val durability. A lot is val durability. This is the standard we have with the surgical valves, quite good results in terms of clinically relevant valve deterioration at 10 year follow up. This is data from, from uh, our center. Up to now, we haven't seen a signal saying that uh, when you have a TAVI, you, uh, your valve will uh, be less durable than a, a, a surgical one. This is data from a partner at five years follow up. I'm not saying that this cannot happen after this uh, period of time, but at least up, up to now there is no signal. We are talking now about lower risk patients, and I think this information is very important. Uh, on the other hand, we have not a lot, but some studies looking at, uh, at up to 10 year follow up, and the rates of clinically relevant, important uh, valve deterioration seem to be similar to those reported in surgery. For sure, there is, uh, there is uh, more studies are needed. The thing is that in the, either in the ACC consensus or the European guidelines, they recommend really serial echoes in these patients. This is not at all what we do in the surgical practice. Is the patient uh, is followed clinically and then after five years you start doing echoes here. The recommend, and I think that this is a good recommendation because you can see uh, subclinical thrombosis, you can see some, uh, some issues. The problem is that this, uh, at least in our center, is, uh, is, a, is a major burden for the center and, and, uh, in terms of uh, following the patients. And, and I think that um, I, I see uh, that the valve clinic has to follow the patient for the first year you have conduction issues, you have paravalvular leaks sometimes, you have, uh, you have to deal so, with so many issues that occur within the first few months. But then I th uh, what we do, at least in our practice, is transfer the patient to the uh, uh, referral cardiologist. And maybe multivalvular disease, low ejection fraction, conduction issues, paravalvular leaks, maybe uh, keep an eye on these patients. Thank you very much for your attention.